Okay, I received the package in the mail and got some new gators or whatever you call these. All right? They look like they're gonna work. So I'm gonna bust into this um, tabular chert, it looks like, and do a rock to point video. That so many of you like so much. Oh yeah, so auction went well, my weekend was good, everything seems to be just fine. Alright, so let's see, what do we got? I did some of this chipping the other day, it seems like it's high quality stuff. Let's see. Oh yes. These skinning flakes will make good arrow hits. I hope. There's some incipient cracks in there, so it may or may not. Mm. Yeah, we'll see. Might might have been too thin. It probably would have been better if I'd taken a thicker flake. Yeah. Let's see if I can take some thicker cortical flakes, beef up these striking areas. All right, let's see. Yeah, a little bit thicker. Nice. I gotta make sure I remember to label those HQR or high quality raw. Even those look, this stuff looks like it's not that great. It's pretty good. I'm grinding it a lot because I notice it's kind of crushy. Let's see. Did it do anything to that lump? Hmm, I don't know. I don't know. Ooh, that lump has cracks in it. That's not good. That's not good at all. All right, so what do we talk about during this reduction? Uh, I did some research today on various topics. I think I was trying to catch up with emails. So whenever I need to do research, it takes me all day to write the emails. And then the auction happened. So I've been just sitting in front of the phone for hours. So it's good to get a break and do some flint napping on some high quality raw stuff. This is high quality stuff. It just once in a while get these little clunkers. That's good. Nice. So I don't know what to talk about. Um, the research I was doing was mainly on primates. Since one of the reasons of, that I got into flint napping was uh, discovering who we are as humans, uh, I did I did a lot of research in the beginning when I first started flint napping on primates and uh, brain development among humans and. All that kind of stuff just to get familiar with the, uh, the science I was looking at it again today so yeah it's a uh, it's actually coming along okay I mean the, the new there's a bunch of new studies and stuff I got I got a subscription to Academia 
net or something like that. I don't know. Anyway, I got a ton of updates that I need to read. I mean, I got a ton. I just, I, I rarely take a look at my inbox on that one. But yeah, I got a bunch. But I try to limit my research these days because it, uh, it, it, it ignores, in my opinion, it ignores a lot of things that should be talked about. And one of the things that it ignores is weaponry, weapons, you know. Stone tools used as weapons. Now I have a bias because I'm very familiar with weapons. I study military history. I know about weapons firsthand. I've trained people how to use weapons. Uh, just modern weapons. They're, you know, of course, very different from ancient weapons, but the basic concepts are very much the same, and humans haven't changed all that much. If you run out of ammunition, you go back to the same old, same old hand-to-hand -hand combat. So, I'm a little bit biased toward weaponry. I see weaponry in just about everything. And it turns out the chimpanzees are very warlike. Oh. Our closest relatives are warlike. I just I just found out that chimpanzees hunt other monkeys, and they're successful at hunting other monkeys, other monkey species. I'm not talking about cannibalism. No, other another species of monkey. I forget the name. Yeah. And doing some reading on how we got how we uh, got meat into our diet early on, uh, which is thought to have contributed to our brain development, right? Because uh, protein is a, is a dense nutrient, dense well, not protein, but animal animal products are nutrient dense you can get protein from many, from different sources not just animal protein um, but anyway yeah I was doing some reading on that and <clears throat> losing track of time and you know how that goes I do enjoy that uh, doing research on human origins and all that, but I'm going to be doing less of it as time goes on. It's starting to get a bit repetitive. I can't really report on too many things that are new other than clickbait type of articles. Scientists are surprised by blah 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 blah. It's surprising that this happened blah blah blah. Did you know that blah, blah, blah? Yeah. Anyway. One question that I remember having, I don't know if I answered this or not, but I think I did answer it, but I did not answer it sufficiently, I don't think. I think I got a... I got people confused on it or at least one person confused uh, creating a biface is not is not a very efficient way to create flakes now some people when they study early man and the way he made his hand axes and other tools uh, I at least one study suggests that these flakes 
are actually what they were after and these are just expended cores and not tools these hand axe looking things but if you want to create flakes uh, doing it by facially like this is not a very efficient way to do it no uh, creating flakes is more efficiently done in one direction with a blocky piece of flint you just you hit in one direction make a flake hit some more one direction and just skin off these flakes this way almost all the ones that come off are usable and it, once you get good at this you can make really long ones with long edges this is a very efficient way to make usable flakes just hitting in one direction just keep hitting in on the same face in one direction it's much more efficient and uses a lot less uses up a lot less material than creating bifaces with cr with creating the biface there's a lot of lot more damage control uh, and uh, smaller flakes to create the contours of the tips and uh, various other contours on the on the biface but when you strike only in one direction they, they all seem to be uh, well the average of these seems to be usable on average they all have nice sharp edges whereas you know bifacial flakes they contain cortex sometimes around the edges they contain cracks because you're damage controlling you know things like that and then all the time it takes to get good at bifacing is an issue for efficiency it's a whole different skill than just striking off flakes in one direction this is a, as a complex skill this bifacial stuff it's complex even modern humans have a hard time with it right so if you can standardize it down or try to get it simplified down to just striking off flakes in one direction you can teach someone to do it and it becomes a lot more efficient yeah, both in terms like I said of uh, conserving material and also conserving time I think I got someone confused by saying the bifacing is is efficient for creating flakes but it's actually not okay even though you know these flakes can be created and they look pretty good that takes a lot of practice I've, I've spent years learning how to do that literally years learning how to do that without causing step fractures and stuff is that an efficient use of my time because there were many years where I couldn't do that but I could knock off flakes in one direction so yeah uh, yeah I just wanted to clear that up hopefully I cleared it up I don't know So yeah, uh, I, I paused there because it looked like a hand axe, but actually what I'm doing is creating a biface. But if I stop at that point where there's a lot of cortex on the back, it looks like a hand axe. Now, um, hand axes, what were they used for? That's a question also. What were they used for? Uh, some people say they were used for cracking into bones to extract marrow as an example uh, that's not a very good use for this because as soon as you touch bone as soon as you hit bone with the tip what happens boys and girls flakes chips shatter goes everywhere and if you're trying to harvest something to eat with flake shatter 
in your food do you think um, you think that's a good strategy for a long life no it is not what kind of stones do you use to shatter bone this kind rounded you can hit along the bone you can break off an end of it the way they extract marrow from a bone is you break the ends off right we smack the ends off but you don't want any chips in your in your food so you use something that doesn't create chips and flakes when you're hitting bone if you hit bone with this it creates chips and flakes if you hit a bone with this it's not so you hit the bone with this you break off the ends and you got this hollow part in the middle what do you do well you can scoop it out with a stick a little at a time and eat it raw uh, if you can't get to all of it you start cracking the, the rest of the bone by hitting it with this just working your way you don't have to smash it right away because that also pr produces bone chips but you can crack it you can start to crack it starts at one end and then you keep hitting it and the crack will propagate down the rest of it you flip the bone over I mean I can do this on video I suppose let me think there I, I have thought about this there are some stores that sell those huge gigantic uh, beef bones I should do a demonstration of getting the marrow out with just a hammer stone and a stick there's so many people think you need something like this this has several disadvantages when working with bone especially when you're trying to smash it for food now this on the other hand is effective against bone as a weapon as a skull crusher or penetrator of skull into the brain it's a gruesome thing to think about it to think about but it can penetrate the skull what happens when you penetrate the skull knock the, you knock your enemy right out it causes shock yeah Not only that, but he's going to have a very hard time recovering from a hole in the head. <laughs> if, he, if he survives. Yeah. And you don't mind uh, bone chips in your enemy's skull. But you do mind bone chips in your dinner of your bone marrow dinner now uh, a lot of archaeologists have hypothesized or have followed the hypothesis or agree with the hypothesis that humans early humans were scavengers of carcasses and that's how they gained access to proteins and meat and bone marrow being scavengers now do I have an opinion on that one you know I do oh yes I've observed scavengers I've researched scavengers scavengers are pretty smart right they have to be scavenging is actually highly dangerous work and it's not always reliable when you kill a, an animal the meat is always fresh when you scavenge an animal it's just wide open you don't know if the meat is fresh or not uh, it could contain other nasty th things in it as it decomposes uh, modern humans are not good at resisting the toxins from decomposed flesh I don't know about ancient humans but I doubt I don't know maybe they'll be able to find it in the genome but I doubt that ancient humans were resistant to the toxins and other nasties within rotted flesh so in my opinion the scavenging the scavengers the human scavengers uh, would not last very long 
definitely my view. Yeah, sure, there was some times where you'd have to scavenge to survive. For a short period of time, you know, short-term strategies. But short-term strategies are not good in the long term. You know, I suppose by definition they're not good in the long term. So I, I put no faith or I don't consider that a good idea to think of humans as scavengers, although they might have been sometimes. With the brain capacity that they have, there's much more efficient ways to gather food and a lot less dangerous ways to gather food. If you're scavenging carcasses, guess who is nearby? We're not the only scavengers. If we were scavengers, we would not be the only ones. What other animals are, are scavengers? And what other animals are attracted to dead meat sitting out in the open? There are many. A lot of them can kick our butts. Especially if they operate in packs. And I think you know what I mean. Wolves come to mind. Now, some might say, well, that's probably how we got close to wolves because we did the same behaviors, blah, blah, blah. Same behaviors, man. Yeah, I studied uh, wolf domestication too, a little bit. Yeah, it appears that wolves were scavenging from us. Scavenging our kills. You know what I mean? Not the other way around. And we would we would let them scavenge our kills. Probably to get rid of the rotted meat so it wouldn't smell bad. Or the, all the rotted flesh and stuff sitting around. We let the scavengers eat it get rid of the smell and the flies you think early humans knew about the dangers of having flies everywhere I think so you think humans early humans were immune to diseases that were spread by flies from carcasses no there are other factors involved in scavenging other than worrying about the actual animals that killed the carcass. It's all the secondary stuff that's happening. The flies, the disease within the carcass, the smell that's attracting other animals, and maybe perhaps other humans. Uh, the smells that, that are, it's pushing away other animals. Some animals will get I don't know if this is, I don't, I'm just, I think I remember this, but I think that the smell of a dead animal kind of makes other animals of the same species flee the area. I don't know if that's true. I, I think I saw that somewhere, but I don't know. Anyway, we'll just ignore that for now. Anyway, you want a, 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 an environment conducive to animals coming nearby, not one where every, Everything is in danger of being eaten. By these nasty predators. Right, you would think. So, my idea is the humans were not scavengers. Unless absolutely necessary. Their main source of protein... was not from animals that they had to go out and hunt with complex weapons, but the easy ones. The ones you can club over the head or catch with your bare hands. You can club a porcupine over the head, for example. <clears throat> you can catch a catfish with your bare hands. Another example. Both of those contain lots of fat, too. I think porcupines are fat fatty animals, right? 
No one else is going to mess with them. We can mess with them because of our brains. We understand that you hit a porcupine with a stick and knock them out. It's pretty handy. It's pretty pretty good way to hunt. The stick is pretty pretty handy, so to speak. So there are many ways to obtain the meat without having to go out and uh, shoot projectiles or make complex stone tools. You can develop a, a good brain without stone tools. And then once you have a good brain, you start to realize, you know what, I think I can make some snazzy stuff out of this stone. Snazzy. Yeah. And spend a lot of time doing it. Because I've already got the food stuff, the I've already got the food thing pretty much taken care of. I can spend time developing a skill like this. You know, I got my stick, I just smack a few porcupines over the head. Catch a few frogs. Do some other, do a few traps, These little deadfall traps, snares, catch a deer or two in a snare, maybe little baby ones that don't know what's going on, some baby uh, peccaries or wild hogs or whatever, wild boars in, in the snares. How would you kill a wild boar in a snare? You, you get a you get a big stick and you smack him in the skull. I mean, it's not that not that difficult, as far as I know. I mean, it might take a few hundred. It might take more than one blow to do it. So you get, you get three or four guys out there all smacking the uh, the boar in the head with with clubs. It won't take long. And they're they're very fatty, and the where the 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 reason I mentioned fat is because it, the fat is also important. Uh, some archaeologists have gone even to the extent of calling us lipivores instead of carnivores because of the amount of fat it seems that we had consumed in the past. So I can think of all kinds of fatty animals that we can get. And we can eat, and we can hunt without using stone. We don't need to use stone to procure the fatty meats that we would need. No. But stone is, it is essential for very intricate tasks, bone carving, wood carving, um, and projectiles, they become they, they it starts to become a part of a system that's complex. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and stone often is desirable to a bone arrowhead, let's say. Uh, bone arrowheads take a long time to make because it requires a lot of grinding. Stone, by comparison. Just uh, 28 minutes to make this, whereas if I were to take a big, huge chunk of bone or tusk, it would probably take many hours to get it down to this thickness. Several hours. So once you have the skill of chipping stone, it goes pretty fast as far as the, uh, the task of creating a usable weapon or a usable cutting tool. Per, you know, I think I said this before, but I tend to look at these things as weapons. Yeah. And until I can figure out a good way to disprove that, if there's a, a good way to disprove that these were good for weapons, you know, if they if it turns out that this really isn't that good of a weapon compared to something else that's 
that was available at the time. I'm going to consider these weapons. Now, some might say the club is the best weapon, even in modern uh, modern times, or relatively modern times, because they still existed on battlefields even up until rel relatively recently, like in the Middle Ages. Clubs were still used in battle. Knights would still carry clubs, and, and they would make them fancy sometimes and turn them into like maces and put iron heads on them and stuff but a lot of the a lot of the depictions that I see of uh, knights during the middle ages had what they what looked like baseball bats yeah so wooden clubs are very very effective weapons so why would you want why would you need a stone uh, well well, I think one of the reasons, I don't know how important this is, but one of the reasons is intimidation. Just seeing another human with a stone blade, holding it, ready to slash, or to pierce a skull or whatever with a stone blade, it's, it's pretty scary with this type of blade. So that helps. Uh, when you want to win a, a battle, you know, to intimidate. Sometimes you don't even have to fight. They just run away. Oh no, it looks like they got knives. We're out of here. They all run away. Just because you got knives like this and not, you know, flipping these little blade, these little bladelets around. I got your blade, I'm going to cut you. <laughs> I know I'm I'm exaggerating and I'm poking fun and stuff. But yeah. If I can do a little more thinking about this, I might come up with something better. This is not a hand axe by the way, it's it's just a biface. I'm trying to get this biface down to where I reached the limit of my ability with the billet. I'm starting to reach my ability with the billet, but the stone itself it has defects, so it's kind of messing with me there. And believe it or not, this stuff is not as good for napping with the billet as the the Georgia chert, I'm getting spoiled by the Georgia chert. This is Texas stuff, high quality raw. But I, I'm having a I'm having a difficult time with the rough face on this, whereas with the Georgia chert I don't. See the rough face on this doesn't really catch the edge in the same way as with the Georgia stuff. Let's see. I gotta smoothen it out. It just takes time. I do have a my sander set up, but I don't want to. I don't want to blast out somebody's ears that's using a micro using headphones right now. So I'll just continue to use this. Yeah, it feels a little bit better. Yeah. See, for some reason, the Texas shirt. It doesn't like the rough billet. Now, when you talk about stone tools, getting back to early man, when you think of stone tools, you usually think of this, right? You think of this. Stone tool, early man stone tool, you think of this. There is a tool more important than this. What is it? What kind of stone tool is more important than this? This. This is a stone tool. You have to know how to use this to make this. This doesn't just get made by itself. You have to know this. This is an important stone tool right here. 
Now, chimpanzees and monkeys, they can use this to crack nuts and stuff, but to create a biface, they have no idea. This is a human thing, to use hammerstone to, to uh, make other things out of stone. The, uh, the chimps and the monkeys I've seen that make flakes like this, they take the flint and they smash it against something else. They don't use a hammerstone to shape it like this. So this is an important stone tool right here, not just this. And why do I mention this? Because archaeologists don't mention this very much. That's why. This is an extremely important stone tool, the hammerstone. If you ignore the hammerstone, you're ignoring half of the stone tool technology. This, this goes together. Hammerstone biface, hammerstone biface. They go together. If you don't have any bifaces, you have no need for this to manipulate stone. And vice versa, you know. So it's important to realize that this is the this is an important stone tool as well. Uh, I don't see it emphasized enough. I think I think a lot of researchers take it for granted. You have to be proficient with this first. You have to be proficient in cracking nuts, pounding. I don't know. Uh, tough roots into pulp so that you can chew it. Um, cracking bones open. There, there probably needs to be a history of using hammer stones before you have these. So if you want to talk about the, chron the uh, chronological progression of stone tools, it doesn't start with these, it starts with these. And then it, as your brain develops, you go, you know what? I can use this for making these. I can try anyway. And as the brain develops, the tools can be used for other things. Anyway. I'm getting tired, so I won't talk too much more about that. I'm losing my ability to thin this anyway with that billet. I'm afraid that if I were to try to thin it anymore, I'll crack the whole thing. So you know how it goes when I reach this stage. Those of you who have watched the channel forever. And uh, thank you very much for everybody's uh, excellent comments on the... The sh little wedding video, short video update. Thank you, thank you. It was a very good day. The weather wasn't so great, but everything else was fantastic. Oh, yes. And uh, I've been receiving a lot of support from subscribers in other ways besides comments and suggestions and emails. People that have been sending me free stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah. Now, is that a hint for you to send me free stuff? No, because I, I have limited storage. I, I don't ask for free stuff. But if, if they, if they uh, volunteer free stuff, I say, yeah. But no, I, I'm not asking for free stuff. I'm just saying thank you very much. There's a lot of support for this channel and for me. Uh, and a lot of questions. I wish I could answer them all, but... Uh, not only is there not much data, uh, but there just isn't... Um, a whole lot of imagination out there so the answers I'm giving a lot of times are just copy paste answers I've heard other people say this I've heard other people say that I've heard researchers say this or that and it's pretty much all the same old same old everyone's regurgitating everybody else's stuff 
Um, and I'm not really actively involved in e experimental archaeology. I'm mainly focused on how to improve the skill, specifically how to improve the thinning skill with my flint napping. Because thinning, thinning is the last frontier for me. I've, I've reached a good spot where I can thin down and make stuff without worrying about it. But now the, the, front, the final frontier is ultra thin. So that's where I'm heading. If I can do ultra thin stuff... I'm pretty much done with my bucket list as far as flint napping goes. I don't really have too many more goals in flint napping other than obtaining the skill to do ultra thin stuff. Yeah. Why is that important to me? I, one of the reasons why I just wanted one of the reasons why I think it's important is I just want to be able to do it, it or see if I'm able to physically and mentally. Because if I'm not, that means the early man had more talent, which is not difficult to accept, but I want to see it by myself. Yeah, I want to see it for myself. Yeah, it would be very interesting. Just can't do what the early man did. That'd be quite a, quite a thing. It means we're regressing. means we're deteriorating as a species now I assume it's not I mean I can't assume that uh, for sure but it sure would seem that way yeah regressing in terms of being able to make things anyway maybe not in other things Like our language skills are vastly improved. We can cr basically create anything we want in our imaginations through language. I think that's pretty advanced and that's probably where it's headed. We're probably headed toward an environment that's created in our brains only. And then we will be living in a kind of a simulation. We're able to manipulate reality to such an extent that it looks like we're changing reality, but what we're doing is just uh, rearranging it. We're not really altering it. We're just making it look like it's being altered. By clever re rearrangement or augmenting it with virtual reality. Augmenting, which means just adding to it adding to our experience in life through artificial means, artificial realities, so that we don't have to experience the natural world. We, we, uh, we may get into a position where we're only experiencing the artificial world and that's it. Even though we may have to occasionally go into the real world to buy groceries and whatnot, most of our time will be spent and probably grocery shopping too, in virtual realities that are not natural. It'll be a shame, yeah. But people tend to like it. People tend to be motivated by fiction and alternate realities. 
Yeah. I got a nickname for that. It 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 tingles their jingles. <laughs> yeah. They get all giggly. With alternate realities. I don't know why. Why are humans that way? I don't know. It's probably a reaction to trauma. They don't like the real world because there's too much suffering. Too much ugliness. Too much trauma. All that stuff. Anyway, this is getting to be where I can't seem to damage control this because there's two different basically two different types of stone here this stone here and then this stone here the uh, this has some layers in it yeah layers in consistency it's acting really weird and again, you know, you get into the middle of a stone, and a lot of times that happens. Yeah. This is really nice. But uh, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to remove it because. It has totally different properties on this side. The striking areas have to be a lot beefier also. I'm finding out for this side than for this side. Because this lighter material crushes easier. I gotta beef up those striking platforms knocking back the material and doing a lot more grinding and yada 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 now yeah it's because of the steel yeah the, the steel does crush it in general steel is very harsh on this stuff but it's a raw stone and steel is usually pretty good on the raw stuff so it's not all because of the steel it's it has something to do with the stone itself Yeah, the inconsistency makes it difficult to run long flakes. Not impossible, but it makes it difficult. And running long flakes is part of the ability to thin. That's half the battle on thinning, knowing how to run the long flakes. The other half, well, I don't know if it's the other half. <coughs> Another big thing is to get these smooth terminations, not these step fracture things. Yeah, it's not too bad. Can I pop those out with a natural tool, like with an antler? Nope. I can't pop them out like that with antler. Although sometimes it probably is possible, it usually is not. The only way to pop those out is with another stone flake or something, if you're lucky, or just run another flake into that area, as I have done in the past. This stuff where I pick out flakes with the spatula tool is, is kind of a new thing. If you look back at my old videos, you don't see too much of that. You don't see much of me picking out those step fractures in the middle. Uh, one, because I really didn't practice up on that particular skill. And number two, I thought I was cheating. I wanted to do it the hard way. I thought I was learning the old ways. <laughs> and if it if I couldn't get it good, get the step fractures out by 
non-picking methods, I just leave it in. That's the old way. Yeah. Turns out people, they want to see a false reality. They don't want to see the old way. They want to call it the old way, but they don't want to see the old way. Except for you weirdos in my comment section that say, yeah, I, don't, I, I want to see the old way where steps are everywhere and thick. I want to see thick steppy points. <laughs> yeah, I know who you are. You know who you are. I know who you are. We all know who you are. We all see the comments. No one's in the dark here, right? Except for you new guys that just joined in. The ones that watch 15.6 minutes tops of any video. If it's longer than 15 minutes, you're out of there. Yep. No matter what it is, even if it's your favorite stuff. No, nope. too much. Anyway. Read the comments and comment in the comments section. It's good for you. Yeah. If nothing else, you'll find out just how bad your spell checker is. Oh, yes. I don't know what it is. My, my spell checker is so bad. It'll turn correct words into bad, into incorrect words. I spell it correctly and it switches it over. It's unbelievable. Yeah. What was I doing the other, like today I was doing a long email and I kept hitting a word and it kept switching it to another word. No, no, I spelled it correctly, but you're switching it to a different word. What in the heck? It's not a spell check. If it's a correct spelling on a word, you leave it. You don't change it. At least it, when I was first using spell check back in the day, it only corrected the spelling on words that were misspelled. It didn't take a correctly spelled word and substitute what you think what it thinks you might, might need there. It's driving me insane. Yeah, and I take I turn the grammar stuff off. And I turn the suggestions on grammar off. You know, because I don't want it underlining my silliness. If I want to be silly and make up words or put punctuation where there shouldn't be or leave the punctuation out, I don't want it telling me that I can't be silly. Yeah. Stupid. Stupid spell checker. It's getting more stupider. Yeah. It's not getting better, it's getting stupider. Pretty soon you won't be able to be creative in your writing. It'll forbid you to type certain words. You'll try to type it in and doot, turn it, change it back. Try to type it in again, doot, change it back. One of these days, it's going to make you not be able to change it to what you want. It's going to say, no, nope, that word's bad. Just wait. I don't want to see it in my lifetime, but I might. Stupid spell checker. They're just getting us ready to tolerate all this stupidness. Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine? They might charge me higher prices for gas if I use too many so-called bad words. Yeah. Sorry, but you are... You are excessively...
polluting the internet, so we're gonna raise your taxes. <laughs> oh gosh. And uh, eighty percent of the population agrees with that because they don't like you. You are your words. Yeah. That's the beauty of democracy. I can just see it. Oh. Anyways, anyways, am I making some progress with this? I kind of am, but I'm kind of not because I'm, I'm seeing where this may just defeat me right here. Yeah, these these stiff fracturings. I'm trying to thin down a thin point, right? I'm going as far as I can possibly go, up to the limit of my capacity. That's basically how you uh, grow, anyway. Uh, you know, I was talking about the last frontier with me is the ultra thin. So every every time I do a piece, there is benefit for me to go as thin as I possibly can, not only for the video itself, or, but toward my goal of being able to do ultra thin pieces. Yeah. I got a feeling I got to focus mainly on certain types of stone. I won't be able to go ultra thin with everything. It's going to have to be certain types because this is ridiculous. It may be a certain type of tool. I'll just use the same, the same type of tool over and over and over. It probably won't be steel. Steel is good and all, but it's still, with, with certain types of stone, I don't know. It'll get it thin, but it, it won't get it ultra thin. I guess I'm getting spoiled with the Georgia stuff. Yeah. Same thing happens when I get hornstone also. I get spoiled with it. So when I go back to this Texas stuff, it gets all steppy. Yeah. I might just continue this tomorrow. I might just continue. Yeah. I still haven't recovered from all those free drinks. Oh yes. I mean they weren't free, but it was an open it was an open bar, so golly. Yeah. Ouch! Now that that cleared the top off, but then it went too too far and dived a little bit. Look at that. See, it, when it goes to a different consistency of material, it thought it was going to go down through there because it's a path of least resistance. Luckily, it didn't, because it could have just chopped the whole thing in half with a with an overshot. Luckily it popped back out, but now I got a defect. I got a little furrow in there. Yeah. No, this they, they do exist on real artifacts. When you start getting really, really thin, you can see furrows on real artifacts. But I don't like them. They might seem cool, but... I don't like them that much. Well, 
Why don't I like them? Because it's uh, it's not a, a good habit to get into because it's too close to the reverse hinge type stuff. You gotta try to avoid the reverse hinges. This is dangerously close to being a reverse hinge. You know where it dives in. <coughs> You gotta kind of tune your brain to avoid certain things. I'm sure all of you know that part. Yeah, the step fracturing. This is actually this is excellent step fracturing stone. If you if you like step fractures. <laughs> I wish. I wish I could say that, right? Yeah, you want some step fracturing stuff, man? You'll love this. Let me show you. It's wonderful for step fractures. And you're going to say, awesome, cool, man. Awesome. Yeah, if only. Anyway, that was a good flake. I like that one. But see, I had to get under. I had to get under that nasty stuff. That's about as thin as I can go. Like, that's reaching my limit of my proficiency. Now I gotta regularize it and, and pick out some of this stuff. If I want it to look good. Now, some of you who have followed for a long time can see where I should be damage controlling but I'm not I can see it too but I'm a little bit fried right now some of these damage controlling uh, techniques require a lot of careful precision and planning clean tools I'll try to get rid of as many of those step fractures as I can it just won't do it it won't allow me to take flakes where I want not without a lot of edge contouring and blowing away the width yeah let's see let's see if I can pick some of that out oh wait hold on I could try tapping it Yeah, I could try tapping. It's not that great of an angle. It might dive in, but you know what? I don't care. I don't care. Yeah. I got my new flake deflectors. What else do I need? They're making me happy. Yeah. Even though the stone is giving me fits, everything else is cool. There's a tough spot right there. Yeah. It's a tough spot. For some reason, right there. It's like iron stone, right? If there is such a thing. I 
I just saw someone send me a picture of a stone that looks like metal. Weirdest thing ever. Looks like gray metal. Looks like the stone is some sort of alien gray metal. Weird. All right. Yeah. The only way to get that is to reduce the width by a lot. See, when you do this, when you put a point on the base, it allows you two avenues of attack. I can attack this way, and I can attack that way. If I play my cards right. I don't know if you guys, when you play with dice, if you uh, blow on the dice before you uh, throw the dice, that kind of reminds me of it when I blow the dust off. Maybe I should blow on the stone and before I roll the dice and hit it. Did it do it? Ooh, it tried to do it. Ooh, it tried really, really hard. It's not bad, actually. That stuff, I might be able to get that out. Maybe. Could I prepare the edge a little bit better? Always. With my technique, I could always prepare it a little bit better. But I stop short of being perfect because it takes a long time. It really gets on my nerves when it's taking a long time. So I'll live with a little bit of defectiveness. Now is that compatible with my ultra thin quest? No, unfortunately it's not compatible with my quest for ultra thin. In my quest for the ultra thin biface I've got to be extremely careful with all of my edge work and everything else which is going to be a total change of mindset eventually I'm easing into it slowly yeah gosh that's steppy Yeah, but that's what happens when you try to thin down a thin piece, as I like to say. Could I have regularized the edges sooner and then made it more narrow sooner and then sent in some bold flakes instead of just chipping around haphazardly? Yeah, with hindsight, you can do anything. Everything is fixed with hindsight. Yep. I could have been so much better if I had done this or that or this or that. In flint napping. Yeah. Does it apply to the next one? Does the lessons learned from this apply to the next? Not directly. It's the cumulative effect. Cumulatively, your experience will affect the future ones. Individually, not so much. Unless you're using the same stone. Like if I had a bunch of those nodules and they all acted pretty much the same, then yeah, the previous experience 
influences the next one directly. But chances are, it's not going to be the same. Chances are the next stone not going to be the same. It's a whole new ball of wax. Almost. It's going to be similar, but it's not going to be. It's not going to be like a piece of wood that you can pretty much know that the next piece of wood is going to be the same. Maybe a few knots here and there will be different. Maybe the grain is tighter. Maybe the wood is a little more dense. It's just not going to vary that much. Yeah, because I do word working as well as flint napping. Wood is predictable. Compared to this, wood is extremely predictable. And sometimes this is not too bad, you know, flint napping can get predictable, especially if you're using stuff like this, you know, this obsidian stuff. But um, if you're just picking up gravel, or if you're just using gravel charts, it's very different. And speaking of gravel, someone asked me, I bet you... I'm finding all kinds of good stuff in in the uh, in the countryside when I went to that wedding. Am I finding good stuff out there? I didn't see any good big stuff, but like for instance, the uh, the Airbnb that we stayed at had gravel in the driveway that had flint in it. So the the uh, the chunks were about this big. No, let's see. Some of the chunks in the gravel were this big. And they were flint like this. Except, you know, gravel has rounded edges. But yeah, I found many pieces like this of flint in the gravel in the gravel driveway. Because you know us, as flint navers, we're looking at every piece of stone we can. Yeah, right in the driveway there was flint. And good flint, not just bad flint, good flint. I could have picked up a bunch of stuff for little arrowheads. I could I could have picked up maybe two buckets full of this stuff. Two five gallon buckets. If I had spent the whole day looking through all the gravel. Yeah. I have been known to do that. But not this time. And I don't need pieces that small anymore. I've been there and done that many times. I've worked the small stuff many, many, many times. The free small stuff. I'm spending the money these days to get the good stuff. So yeah, I'm just uh, regularizing and symmetrizing sharpening too if I can there's places here and there where I could take thinning flakes so if, if I see one I'll take one but I'll wait till after I finish regularizing yeah I should have gone in several minutes ago but I want to see how this turns out at least for the the regularizing, I want to see. I haven't done much pressure flaking on this particular stone. The pressure flakes, all right. No complaints there. 
So yeah, I'll call it. I'll call it. I don't feel any flakes in my shoes. This is the first. That was a big nodule. Again, I forgot to weigh the nodule before I started. And I got the scale right here. See? I even got it right there. Right in front of me so I don't forget. I tell you. ADHD. You know, you get focused on one thing and you see nothing else. Yeah. All right, so that I think that's it. I'll finish and I'll, I'll continue tomorrow with other stuff. I got a lot of errands to do tomorrow, so I might just post a short video on something else besides this. But if I do decide to refine this even further, I'll put it on video. All right. Okay, that's it.